So today, Pentecost, as Jenny says, it's the day when we remember and we celebrate. We, we celebrate it as the birthday of the church. And we change with each birthday. I brought along, this is very precious because I've only got one or two pictures, but this is a photo of me as a small child. For those on the phone, it's me in a very frilly swimming costume, standing in a paddling pool with three buckets, a ball and a jelly mold. And uh, I'm, my face is next to that, so you can see my face isn't nearly as round as it was then. Um, I have about the same amount of hair, but I've changed in other ways as well. I'm not so easily entertained. I'm far less likely to spend the whole day in a paddling pool with three buckets, a ball and a jelly mold. As we grow, we change. If you look closely at me, I have a scar down one cheek. I fell over at about that age in Nonsuch Park and I grazed the whole of my cheek. It's not so easy to see now because it sort of blends in with all of the wrinkles. But as we grow and we change, we're marked by our life, we're changed by our life, we adapt to our life. And the church is the same. Although we look back to the church that we see in Acts 2 and take it as a model for our church, in actual fact, our expression of church is different every year. This year, we are not able to gather together. But it doesn't make it any less church because it's over the phone or online. And we're challenged again to grow and to change. And we can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I've got an illustration to demonstrate what the Holy Spirit is like. So I've brought along this really heavy weight. Oh, hang on. I'm just going to lift it up and put it on here. Here we go. Oh, ah, there we go. Now, I know it looks like two plungers stuck together, but it is, in fact, a really heavy weight. And at this point, if we were meeting together, I would ask for a volunteer from amongst our young people and children. But um, John is volunteering, but unfortunately, um, he won't be able to do this. But I do have someone here who can help me with this illustration. So I'm just going to go and see. Are, are you okay to help? Are you willing to come and help? Yeah? Is that all right? No, they're not scary. They're really not, I promise. Come. Yeah? Do you want to come and say hello? Here we go. Do you want to wave to them all? Now, for the benefit of those of you on the phone, his name is John, and um, he's a puppet. It, well, you are, aren't you? Yes, you are a puppet. So he's going to try to help me by lifting up this really heavy weight. Are you ready? Ready? You, there you are. Hold on to it. You've got a good grasp. And lift. Oh, that didn't quite work, did it? Do you want to try again? Lift. Oh, careful you don't strain yourself. Can't do it, can you? No. Never mind. Don't be sad because I can help you. Yeah, I can help you. So if I hold your hands, okay, and you hold this weight with me, with my hands, let's see. Do you think we can lift this? Oh, that was easy, wasn't it? Yeah, let's try again. Oh, look at you. You're lifting this really heavy weight because I'm helping you. Well done. Should we put it down? Yeah, here we go. Well done. Thank you very much. Now, because you've helped me, um, I'm going to give you this chocolate. But because you're a puppet, you won't be able to eat it. So I'm going to take it home and we'll eat it together, okay? Okay. So you're going to wave bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Come on, then. Thank you very much for your help. You comfortable? Good. And I'll just move this. Oh, oh. Heavy weight. We don't have the power in us to follow Jesus in our own strength. We don't have the power and the strength in us to do all the things that he's told us to do. We can't change the world as Jesus has called us to do without God's help. We can't change the church without the Holy Spirit, God's help in his church, in us.
But the good news is, of course, that God promised his Holy Spirit to us. He promised us the power and the strength that we need to follow Jesus. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The disciples were changed men after the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. Before the Holy Spirit came, the disciples were fearful and hiding away. After the Holy Spirit, the disciples were bold and courageous. They came out of hiding, out of lockdown, and into the streets of Jerusalem, where they told people about Jesus. Before the Holy Spirit came, the disciples didn't have the strength or the power to do the things that Jesus had asked them to do. After the Holy Spirit came, the disciples had the strength and the power to do everything that Jesus had asked them to do. Peter's first sermon resulted in the conversion of around 3,000 people who turned to Jesus. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see the amazing things that God enabled the first disciples to do. The Holy Spirit was given to the disciples to give them the power to continue the work of Jesus and to change the world. But what about today? We may feel powerless under our changed situation in our unfamiliar world. But the Holy Spirit that was given to the disciples then is the same Holy Spirit that's given to us now. We can follow Jesus and do the things that he asks us to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to stop and we're going to pray. You might like to do as Jenny suggested, close your eyes and open your arms. And we're going to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Father God, we know that following you is not a matter of willpower, but the power of your Holy Spirit in us. As we gather virtually today, pour out your spirit on your church, your church in our homes, your church across this country, this nation, and the world, scattered, and yet all one church together, because it is all empowered by your Holy Spirit. We welcome you here today. Help us, Lord, to worship you to listen to your word and to pray in faith and to know that whatever the future holds for our church, if it is filled with your Holy Spirit, it is empowered and enabled, just as the first disciples were. May we grow in our love for you and for one, in, one another in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I do indeed. Um, I'm reading from the New English Version of the Bible, and today's reading is from the le first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, and I'm reading the whole of chapter 2. As for me, brothers, when I came to you, I declared the attested truth of God without display of fine words or wisdom. I resolved that while I was with you, I would think of nothing but Jesus Christ, Christ nailed to the cross. I came before you weak, nervous and shaking with fear. 
the word I spoke, the gospel I proclaimed, did not sway you with subtle arguments. It carried conviction by spiritual power, so that your faith might be built not upon human wisdom, but upon the power of God. And yet, I do speak words of wisdom to those who are right for it. Not a wisdom belonging to this passing age, not to any of its governing powers, which are declining to their end. I speak God's hidden wisdom, his secret purpose, framed from the very beginning, to bring us all to our full glory. The powers that rule the world have never known it. If they had, they would not have Christ crucified the Lord of glory. But in the words of scripture, things beyond our seeing, things beyond our hearing, things beyond our imagining, all prepared for, by God for those who love him. These it is that God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit explores everything, even the depths of God's own nature. Among men, who knows what a man is, but the man's own spirit within him. In the same way, only the Spirit of God knows what God is. This is the Spirit we have received from God, and not the Spirit of the world, so that we may know all that is God of his own grace and given to us. Because we are interpreting spiritual truths to those who have the Spirit, we speak of these gifts of God in words found for us not by human wisdom, but by the Spirit. A man who is unspiritual refuses what belongs to the Spirit of God. It is folly to him. He cannot grasp it, because it needs to be judged in the light of the Spirit. A man gifted with the Spirit can judge the worth of everything, but is not himself subject to judgment by his fellow men. For, in the words of Scripture, who knows the mind of the Lord? Who can advise him? We, however, possess the mind of Christ. Here endeth the reading. Thank you, Adrian. Abby's going to... Uh, Abby. <laughs> Matt is going to bring us our talk for this morning. Yeah, I've just had a... Uh just had a few things scary signs pop up my screen that say my internet connection is unstable so i think we better pray before we start uh, that we make it through this so let's pray together um lord god may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always pleasing to you our rock and our redeemer amen Okay, so as other people have said, um, today we mark Pentecost, which uh, Sarah used a phrase earlier in the service, the birthday of the church, which I have written down at the top of my, um, the top of my notes for this morning. And it's, it couldn't be more true, really, that phrase. Um, without the Holy Spirit, uh, the disciples were not the church. Um, You'll probably be familiar with the story in Acts that Sarah started reading out. But I wonder how often we think about how the disciples are actually feeling by this point in the New Testament. They've had a tough month or so by anybody's standards. First, they see Jesus, the man they thought would lead a rebellion against the Romans, crucified. And it's hard to imagine a more pathetic end to a rebellion. Then he rose again and appeared to them. But they still don't really get it, asking, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus responds that they should wait in Jerusalem until they receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Then he ascends into heaven with the hated Romans still very much in charge. So over the course of roughly 40 days, the disciples have seen Jesus do the shameful by dying, the impossible by rising again, and the bewildering by leaving them. To them, the cross must have seemed to prove that Jesus was a fraud. And then the resurrection proved that he was God. 
that the Ascension must have battled the most of all. Why, at the height of his power and having beaten death itself, would he leave them alone? You wouldn't blame any of them for being fairly confused and emotional by the time Pentecost rolls around. And the problem, I think, is that despite following Jesus for several years, none of them truly understood who he was or why he'd come. They all had their own hopes and ideas and dreams, of course, but none of those involved being nailed to a Roman cross. They didn't understand that the cross was not a defeat, but a victory. God's plan had not failed. The cross was the plan. But Pentecost and the Holy Spirit into our life today changes this. It helps us to see the cross clearly with the mind of Christ. Instead of foolishness, we see wisdom. Instead of weakness, we see power. And that's why Paul makes it the focus of his work among the Corinthian church, deciding to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He doesn't want to trick them into believing using fancy words, which would empty the cross of Christ of its power. Instead, he relies on simply declaring the message of the cross and backing that up with a demonstration of the spirit. He even takes pride in his own timidity and weakness because it proves that any success he has is due to the power of God and the work of the spirit in his listeners. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no place for reason or logic in faith. Of course there is. The Spirit himself gives gifts of preaching and evangelism and apologetics to all sorts of people. And reason and logic are vital for those. At Pentecost, it took both the Spirit and Peter's sermon to convert the crowd. But by itself, an impressive sounding sermon will never be enough. The hearer must see and feel the truth of what you're saying which requires the intervention of the Holy Spirit. He, not us, has all the power. Now, our passage talks about some of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us when we receive him. And I think we can clearly see these at work in Peter and the other disciples at Pentecost. Firstly, the Spirit reveals to us the unfolding of God's wisdom throughout history and even before history. He helps us to see that before stars or planets or people, God had decreed that the world would need saving and that he himself would be its saviour. When Peter receives the Holy Spirit, he suddenly realises that the cross was not a plan gone wrong, but a result of God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. His eyes are open to the fact that all scripture ultimately points to Jesus. And he quotes Psalm 16, written by King David but fulfilled by King Jesus. And that's why it's so important to pray for the Holy Spirit's help as we read the Bible. He is the one who helps it to make, helps it to make sense to us, to follow the thread of salvation all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Just as the Spirit helps us to understand scripture, he helps us to understand the gifts bestowed on us by God, namely righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Now, Peter had been as keen as any of the other disciples for Jesus to establish an earthly, physical kingdom. But he suddenly realises that that was never the mission. The mission was to secure forgiveness of sins through the cross. And this is what Peter offers to the crowd. Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. Not only does the Spirit help us to understand the gifts God has given us, but we speak of these things in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Now, while Jesus was still with them, he had told the disciples not to worry when they were brought before the rulers or authorities to explain their faith. Do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. The Spirit helps us to come to terms with our new Christian identity, rather with our new reality and teaches us a whole new vocabulary in order to explain it, to give a reason for the hope that we have. And we can clearly see that in Peter's sermon, that first Pentecost. This is a man who, up until this point, had managed to be both a bit of a coward and also fairly brash and tactless. Yet, as Sarah said, here we see him standing up in front of a huge crowd of strangers, 
and somehow finding the words that convince 3,000 of them to give their lives to Christ, having been cut to the heart, as the passage calls it. I think it would be a huge mistake to put this down to Peter's natural talent. It's clear that he has been given the right words to say by the Holy Spirit he's just received, and that that same spirit is moving in the hearts of his listeners. Our passage also promises that the spirit will, will reveal things yet to come, things that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived. Peter miraculously seems to see ahead into God's future plans, realising that the gospel is not going to stay contained amongst this small group of a hundred or so people, but instead that the offer is there for anyone in the crowd who wants it. The promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. And today the Spirit continues to speak through dreams, through vision, through prophecy, all of which are designed to give us a glimpse of the things that God has prepared for those who love him. The Spirit also helps us in our prayer life. Because he is God, he has access to what our passage calls the depths of God, the deep things of God. He intimately knows the mind of God, meaning that we can know it too. In prayer, we're made privy to the throne room of heaven, something that formerly was restricted to a handful of Old Testament prophets. We can bring petitions before the king and intercede confidently on behalf of others. But even when we are at our lowest, unable to pray ourselves, the spirit himself intercedes for us in our weakness. The final function of the Holy Spirit in our passage is to give us spiritual insight, to help us discern and accept the things that come from God. By implication, he also helps us to recognise the things that come from the enemy that don't come from God and avoid straying into those things. Because we have the mind of Christ, we have an entirely different operating system controlling our thoughts and actions than we did before we were Christians. During the story of the first Pentecost in Acts, many onlookers thought that the disciples must be drunk because they were babbling in numerous different languages. As our passage says, those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God, the gifts of God's spirit, for they are foolishness to them and they are unable to understand and spiritually discern. But Peter, with his newfound spiritual insight, knows is not the result of too much wine but he sees clearly so what encouragement can we take from our passage and from pentecost well i think primarily it doesn't matter that we're old or tired timid because god deliberately chooses people like this choosing people like this makes power more evident the more helpless he can help. We needn't worry about how to explain our faith to our family. If we trust the Spirit's guidance, as to say, and He will provide the power to change hearts and lives. Secondly, however complicated and difficult the scriptures can be to understand, and they really can be, we have an interpreter. We can grasp the power and wisdom of the power and wisdom of God's salvation plan laid out in the Bible. Having and interceding for us opens up a whole new level of prayer, of intimacy. He can be our guide as we explore the very depths of God and give our prayers power. With the spiritual insight he brings, we have all the tools we need to reject the bad and choose the good in every aspect of our lives, to discern God's ways and God's will for us. Because of Pentecost, we never have to look at life in the same way again, but instead through the mind of Christ. Amen.